as caregivers, we all have to have a good understanding of this, those seven stages. We have to comprehend and understand and feel the need for us to understand the theory of retrogenesis and we need to know what the client's basic functions are, what they're able to perform. So I married all these three together and I came up with these stages that you're seeing. Okay? Essentially what it is, I'll give you an example. <clears throat> um, stage 7, we don't have any clients at stage 7 right now. I'll talk a little bit about stage 7. Stage 7 are infants like. Okay? We are talking about clients who, you know, are either wheelchair bound or bedridden totally. They cannot, they can follow very, very minimal direction. Okay? And these are the stages anyone with dementia Alzheimer's at some point will get to if they continue to live. Okay? Because there's a, you, you, the clients do progress from stage one all the way up to stage seven, depending on their lifespan, their life cycle. But getting from stage one to stage two, it takes what, anywhere from eight to 18 months. So there are time frames when clients get from one stage to another. Okay? If they continue to live long, it's, it's inevitable for us to avoid the progression. You know, for, not, not, the, not the progression, the, the, you know, the transition from one stage to another. Okay? So what I did was, we got to take care of our clients. And, and I didn't know this. I'm, I'm talking about seven years ago and I did not know this. When I was practicing as an occupational therapist, and I started working with clients with dementia Alzheimer's and uh, you know one of my things was I was uh, I was very good at uh, actually teaching clients to feed themselves that's one thing I picked up and I, I did very well and uh, <clears throat> my caregivers would come up to me and say that uh, you know I'm gonna give my client a shower I said okay you know I'll wait you know so you, you gotta come back after half hour I said that's fine and I see this client in the shower screaming and yelling well, I was young, I was, I mean, I didn't know better, you know, I was just getting to learn and do things and I, I had no idea, okay? But now I'm, no, I'm beginning to learn these things. Can you imagine taking an infant and putting that infant in a shower? If you do that, what happens? They scream and yell. Let's go back to stage six, okay? If you look at stage 6, 12 to 18 months old, 12 to 18 months old, we take this client and if we put them in a shower, what happens? You can't do that. And it's being done. It's being done. Not here, but it's being done. And what do you do with a 12 to, uh, 12 to 18 month old? It's much pain. Okay, how do you, how do you, get them to participate. You put the, take the child, put it in a little small tub, and you start sponge bathing. You think they'll participate? No. They, you, you have to win their confidence, their trust. They have to know you. They bond with their mother or you know, whoever cares for them on a consistent basis. And that's exactly what our clients need. Okay? So essentially, it is not to treat our clients like a child, but we need to understand what the developmental stages are. Same thing with dressing. Okay, I'll give you an example. I think some of you will, you know, nod your head. Uh, let's look at level two and level three. Eighteen months to three year old, four to ten years old. They like to wear the same shirt and pant. No matter. What do you give them? My son was four years old. He loves a Spider-Man outfit. He wants to wear that every single day. Am I going to fight him? What if I fight him? What's going to happen? He's going to scream and yell. He likes... He, 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 he loves this pair of jeans now. He, he's crazy about those pair of jeans and shirt. And he wants to wear them every day. I mean, I kind of wrestled with him. I was not getting anywhere with him. I just went and bought four more pairs of the same pants instead of shirts. <laughs> I said, you know what? If that's going to make you happy, if that's going to make your day, and if that's going to stop me, us having this battle every single morning, let's do it. There's nothing wrong. It's about our clients. It's not about us. It's not about, hey, you know what? I feel like I think my mom should wear this or my dad or my client should do this. It's not about us. It's about them. 
And, and, and this kind of gives you an idea what those stages mean. And I think if you sit and read the stage, I, I don't want to go through the entire list, but if you see, you start applying those things, you know, same with brushing your teeth, feeding. I mean, you can expect uh, an 18 month old to feed themselves. They will feed, but how do they feed? They'll use finger food, his hands, spillage all over. Okay? And, you know, what do we do? We have to find ways to protect them. And, and so in a, in a similar fashion, we do not, and again, I want to emphasize and impress on this, we do not treat our, child, uh, our clients as children, but we need to understand what, this, what their developmental stages are for us to care for them the right way. And, and this is slowly catching up. This was very controversial, very politically incorrect, you know, a few years ago. You know, people felt that, oh, you know, you're, you're treating my mom or dad or, you know, or even caregivers. You know, they were not embracing it. Now slowly, bigger associations, agencies are beginning to embrace this because if I don't understand who my client is, what my client is, where they're coming from, how do I care for them? How can I care for them? You're going to make their life stressful. Now, I'll give you an example. <clears throat> You know, there are some times, and uh, you know, the clients you know, would say, hey, I don't want to take a shower today. Okay, we'll try it again. I don't want to take a shower. We'll try it again. Or I don't want to shave. Well, shower, we, I think we're pretty you know, careful. You know, we try our best to coax them and motivate them. And, but things like you know, shaving or, or you know, not, not to do with personal hygiene, we kind of go a, lenient, a little bit lenient on them. The only reason is, you know what, if that's going to agitate them, if that's going to turn them into, you know, make them unhappy and make them restless, why bother? Hey, they can go with a day without shaving. And I'm not saying that we'll leave your, the client without shaving, you know, unshaven. If you see it's not being done, please let us know, you know, but there's a reason. You see that it's all about them, it's all about our clients. And, and now, how does this apply to what we do here? Oh, these five principles are great. You know, what are we doing with these five principles? Yes, we need to come up with a care plan. And I, I invite you guys to take a look at the care plan. If there's something that we didn't do right, please let us know. Because it's truly a partnership. Caring for clients with dementia, Alzheimer's is not like, a, you know, a, a regular assisted living. It, it's a, a partnership. When we raise our children, when the children are in preschool or in kindergarten or, you know, uh, elementary school, we, we partner with our teachers, right? I mean, the teachers can do whatever they want. I mean, and if, if, the, if there's no, nothing, no contribution from the family or from the parents, I mean, the child is not going, is getting anywhere. I see a similar uh, a relationship. Uh, uh, hopefully, we can continue to develop as we move forward, you know, with caring for, you know, for, for, your, for your loved ones. And, and, and we need that partnership. There are so many things we don't know. We... We observe them and we come up with this care plan. Uh, the care plans are so specific, so specific. What do you tell them? How do you tell them? When do you tell them? How much? That's how much we break it down. You know, it, it, we, you have to be careful. There are certain things that if you say, and you should know what to say, and that's something that we have to learn. And we learn, you know, sometimes through trial and error. Sometimes, you know, we, we get that information from you. And we say that, clients respond right away. And then she writes it down on the book. So when caregivers go, they have to read that. And every caregiver has to follow the same instructions. Okay, they cannot deviate from the instruct those instructions. And that's our biggest challenge. That's our biggest human challenge. And I think that's very important, very important for our caregivers to understand. That's uh, very important for our clients to go through. Because what happens, you do the same thing every day, the same fashion, the same way, the same method, you're repeating it, the same process, you're establishing a routine, the routine becomes a structure. Now, if a client is able to dress his or her lower body, if we, and we know that he or she can do, and we encourage them, say the right things, say the right things to motivate them to do, and they keep doing it every single day, what happens? They're not going to lose that function. Or they may lose that function, but not within the time frame. You know, when you go from one stage of the disease to another stage, it may take a longer time for them to lose that function. 
the goal, our goal is to focus on that function so that they, the, the objective of the program is we cannot cure the disease. However, we can make it very comfortable for them, we can give them quality life, we can give them a life filled with dignity, we can prolong the stages of the disease by engaging them in those functions that they can do. Okay? There's a good chance, there's a good chance, if someone can dress their upper body, okay, upper body is a, a, a lower function, lower body is a higher function, which means that you should know how to put your, you know, shirt first before you can put your pants on, or you or before you can even progress to buttoning, unbuttoning and stuff like that, those are all very higher functions. If you keep doing the same thing over and over, there's a good possibility, again, there's a very good possibility. The only reason I say there's a good possibility is there are new studies that are showing that brain cells do regenerate with brain power activities. Okay? So there's a very good chance that they will start dressing the lower body. That directly is tied to those ADL functions. We try our best to slow the disease process. Eighty percent of the activities that we do here are therapeutic. Okay? Twenty percent are entertainment. Okay? I'll give an example and uh, we have these stages, right? So the stages are anywhere from from infancy all the way up to a four-year-old. How many four-year-olds or even five-year, six-year-olds, you know, we bring some kind of entertainment? You know, you take them to some kind of music or, you know, that you can actually keep them focused. My children can't focus even in church. I mean, for five, I mean, they have to go to Sunday school. I mean, they cannot sit with me because five minutes stops, they're pulling the pencil, moving this, they're restless, they're moving around. It, it's, that's how they are, okay? A clown will entertain them, okay? Well, we can't do clown here because we gotta be age specific also. Even though they have these, these stages, we are dealing with something even bigger. Now I have, the lower, the, the early developmental stages, but I also have an adult that I'm dealing with. Adult has their adult personalities that they had have developed over time. So we have to look at both these personalities, both these characters, both the you know both these virtues, and and we have to come up with a plan. So what we did was our activities program. You know we started this activities program, and um, we are slowly rolling it out. Um, our activities program actually focuses on uh, these elements. Anything and everything that we do, yes, of course we do entertainment, we play bingo, I'm not against bingo, please don't take, you know, take me wrong, I know, those are fun stuff, playing cards is fun stuff, those are good memory skills and things like that. But uh, when we do activities, what, I've, what we focus on is six areas. Okay, one is a, a social emotional activity. One of the things that you see is with clients with dementia Alzheimer's, the social emotional thing seems to be missing. Some 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 element of it. Okay, then the large motor skill, you know, which is standing, balance, sitting, you know, all big big large motor activities, small motor activities, you know, which would be you know pegs, like little fine motor buttoning, unbuttoning, a lot of little little stuff. Visual activities, you know, visual orientation, depth perception, things like that. Reasoning, ability to reason. We we do, uh, we actually reasoning, sequencing. We do enactment of uh, TV shows that they can think of, that they can remember, and have them actually play it for us. Take them through sequences. Okay, are they able to sequence? Are they able to thought process and things like that? They may do sometimes, they may not do. It doesn't, we're not interested in the quality. We're interested if they're able to do that. Okay, last but not the least is language. Language goes, uh, you know, with, with the progression of the disease, language goes away. Okay, so it's very important. Expressive, receptive part of language. It's very important for us. And these are the key elements that we focus on. So any activity that we do, we want to make sure that these components 
then all the six elements are part of that activity. Like for, I'll, I'll give you a good example. Let's say that I mean uh, we do a, a cornhole game. Clients who can stand, clients who can sit. They're standing, they're sitting. That's a large motor activity. If they swing their arm, that's a large motor activity. They lean down, which is balance, also is a large motor activity. They're looking at the uh, at the, the the bean bag, and 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 it's a visual. They look at the hole. There's a distance. There's a depth. Okay. And, and, and gives them a sense of visual orientation to what they're looking at. Now, they're interacting with other players. That becomes part of language. You see that? that that's what we do. We bring in activities that has all that, that addresses all these elements. Why do we do that? There's a reason why we do that. These six areas are so essential for us to do our basic functions, ideal functions. So it's very important. And uh, again, activity is something that we're working on. It's, it, we're doing it in phases. And uh, who do you think would be the best person to do, to engage, do this kind of activity? Someone who has a lot of patience. Someone who has a lot of tolerance. Because you, they, they will start the activity and all of a sudden I lost a client client is walking around, which is fine. I'm not going to redirect that client. Let them go. They'll come back, visual. They'll come back where the group is, where there's a lot of noise, there's a lot of action. They will come back. Okay. And uh, in my experience, I did a lot of uh, voluntary work you know, with my kids and uh, I think someone with like preschool degree or someone with uh, that kind of education will do well, but they have to understand the disease also. I'll give you an example, um, and I, I, I'm, I'm sharing this because it, it makes sense. It will make it may make sense to you today. It may not make sense to you today, but it'll make sense to you some sometime down the road. There are certain things our clients do a certain way. There is a reason why they do that. I have a client that. Uh, I, I still have, uh, uh, you know, she's upstairs, and uh, she's been with us for a very long time, and she's progressed, you know, her disease has progressed, and all of a sudden she's actually using the corridor as a bathroom, as a toilet, okay? Caregivers, oh, you can't do that. Yes, of course you can't do that. But there's a reason why she's doing that. We started doing a little bit more research. She used to live in West Virginia. And that's what they did when they were young. They went out. Okay. There's a reason why our clients act a certain way. It is up to us as providers, up to us as caregivers to figure it out. To find out. The only way we can do that is with your help, with your support, and with your participation. And, uh, and it's really, uh, it, it's a partnership caring for <clears throat> clients with dementia Alzheimer's. Now one thing, um, I always tell my caregivers, my, my staff, and I think, you know, when you go through the double doors, those two white double doors, when you go through the, those double doors, you are entering into a different world. You forget your world, you, you leave your world outside, you leave the world that you're oriented to and immerse yourself into your mom's and dad's world. Don't try to reorient them. Don't try to redirect them. You will only cause agitation. You will only create other, you know, unwanted emotional, um, you know, responses. Get into their world. Make it fun and exciting. Their world is so much fun. There's so much you can learn. And, and, and become part of the world. Sometimes, I'll, I'll give an example. I had a client uh, upstairs, and she's one of them actually who helped me write this program. Uh, is, uh, you know, one of them, and I can tell their names, it's uh, Eunice Von Blatt, she's still up there with us. Uh, Norma Wright, uh, uh, Dorothy Hill. Uh, these are some of my clients who really helped me shape this program. And uh, Norma, <clears throat> uh, 
came from a very well-to-do family, and uh, she used to own six, seven planes, airplanes, and she loved flying. She and her husband always flew, they were out of New York, and uh, she loved fast cars, convertibles. And every single time, you know, she would see me or, you know, she would see a car outside, she wants to get it, she wants to get out, she wants to go have fun. And I get, I get involved in it. I wouldn't say, you can't go. I wouldn't say, hey, you know, start your car. It's too hot outside, too cold outside. I get into the car mode, I get into the convertible mode, I, we start talking about cars. From cars, I, I, I move her to, you know, tires. You know, wheels, rims, uh, uh, engines, and horsepowers, and if she can continue to participate, from there I move her to planes, airplanes, and move her from topic to topic to topic to topic and bring her back to land. Sometimes it takes a minute, sometimes it takes 20 minutes, 30 minutes, but that's the best way to do it. I did not rock her world, I did not create, you know, create anything crazy in her world. You know, she'll say, I want to go see my dad, she's 97 years old. I'm not going to tell her that your dad is no more. It doesn't make sense. It may make sense to me, but not to them. And I start asking questions about her dad. When he was born, how old he is, what he did for a living, you know, what did they do together? I get to know her. And I'll tell you, they'll tell you stories. It's amazing. Some of the things that you, even as a child, would have heard from them. And I want to thank you for coming and I, I can take questions now.